sun dips down so we're at across town crowded places they see your faces warming glow from a coffee shop bars that seem to never shut watch the lights changes as the day fades all the things i thought i knew i feel like the morning dew Home is just a point of view All the while It took me around the world to see You were where I need to be All the while It took me around the world to see You were where I need to be Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome. I'm Michael Kaufman. I am uh, coming to you from Brewster, New York, uh, where I work at a residential treatment school uh, for children, and I'm the farm director here. Today, it's just my huge, huge pleasure to welcome all of you uh, from many parts of the world, actually, um, who are joining us for the Let Us Dream conferences hosted by Binghamton University. And I can tell you there is a cast of almost what seems like thousands ready to um, engage you, to present ideas to you, to just um, help us focus on something our conference planning committee has been working on for what seems now like, well, probably a year. Um, you saw the theme uh, uniting in divisive times. I think the one thing we probably all can agree on is that the last two years we have undergone a major shift in the world, in life, uh, personally, socially, professionally, and that uh, nothing feels quite the same as it did in 2019 when COVID was just a, a something we didn't even know about. Um, we are moving past that uh, intense COVID experience, but it continues to impact us. And layering on top of that war, um, environmental problems, social problems, political drama, uh, <laughs> everybody needs to breathe. And we sort of have that feeling like we need to um, find a, a new fresh beginning. And the fresh beginning that we are hoping for is a united beginning and bringing everyone together. And that is the theme for today. And just to show you how happy and welcome you all are for taking time out of your busy day, out of your career, out of your school uh, work, whatever you are normally doing at this time, you have chosen to be with us. And we really appreciate that. So I want to really have the first person welcome you, and it happens to be Dean Harvey Stenger from Binghamton University, who has recorded a greeting for us. I'm honored to have the opportunity to welcome everyone to Binghamton University's Let Us Dream Conference, Uniting in Divisive Times. Today's conference highlights the work of people in our community who are making a difference in our schools, healthcare organizations, and in the not-for-profit sector. In particular, this year's Let Us Dream Conference focuses on the impact that COVID has had on community institutions and the ways in which the pandemic has reinforced inequalities among groups in society. 
These are important issues, worthy of the careful examination that our speakers will provide. So I want to welcome and thank our panelists, as well as to all of our online participants to this year's conference. I also want to recognize Dean Laura Bronstein and the faculty and students at Binghamton University's College of Community and Public Affairs. CCPA is a gem among Binghamton schools and colleges. CCPA students participate in internships throughout the community, developing professional skills that will sustain them throughout their careers as educators, social workers, and leaders in government and nonprofits. CCPA's alumni work throughout New York State, the nation and the world, leading organizations that feed the hungry and house the homeless, that support the aged and the disadvantaged, that teach our children and work to create a more just and equitable society. Our alumni are on the front lines of service to the community, helping those most in need. Our faculty, too, are engaged in important work. This year's conference celebrates their applied research and community engagement efforts. I also want to thank all of the unsung heroes who will be recognized today for their efforts in changing the world for the better. I think you will find that each of them has an inspiring story to tell and that we can look to each of them as a model of community action. Lastly, I want to recognize the organizations that have been instrumental in bringing this conference together, our co-hosts and sponsors who have worked together to make this such an interesting and innovative program. They include SUNY Broome Community College, Lord's Ascension Health, the Institute for Justice and Well-Being, the New York State Education Department Central Western Community Schools Technical Assistance Center, Binghamton University Community Schools, and of course, the Let Us Dream organization. And I especially want to thank Father Lijo Thomas from Christ University for his work in establishing Let Us Dream. I hope that all of you have a great conference and that by its end, you're ready to pursue new ideas and strengthen existing initiatives to improve our world. Oh, Michael, you're muted. Thank you, President Stenger. And uh, it is now my uh, delightful pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Laura Bronstein, who is the Dean of the College of Community and Public Affairs. And uh, welcome, Dr. Bronstein. Thank you, Michael. Uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending upon what part of the world you're joining us from. And thank you, President Stinger, for your leadership as we open the 2022 Let Us Dream Conference. I'm delighted to be here with you today and to extend a warm welcome to our colleagues and friends from India, as well as those across the United States and any other parts of the world where you may be joining us from. This event is truly inspiring as students, professionals, and community members from different backgrounds join together to discuss how to make positive change within the world. Making a difference takes passion, will, hard work, and expertise applied on multiple fronts to promote growth and the betterment of humanity, as reflected in this year's theme, Uniting in Divisive Times. Today, you'll have the opportunity to hear from faculty and community practitioners whose work aims to unite us. Focusing on education, healthcare, social justice, and more, they generate and implement new knowledge, which allows people of different backgrounds and experiences to come together as an enriched local and global community. I thank them all for sharing their work and wisdom with us today. As Dean of the College of Community and Public Affairs, or CCPA, I'm honored to work every day with students, alums, faculty, staff, and community members who create and implement groundbreaking work to better the communities which they represent and are a part of. CCPA is dedicated to service informed by evidence, a combination that fulfills our mission of positively impacting our world. We're committed to addressing systemic bias and oppression that is part of the fabric of the institutions where we live and work. CCPA alums lead organizations that work for gun control and fight for human rights, among many others. Our students and alums are in our governments, our schools, universities, and hospitals. 
but most of all in our communities. Through innovation and empathy, CCPA students exemplify how we can come together, regardless of the differences which threaten to divide us, by creating new ways to be agents of change in a rapidly evolving world. Now, please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Dr. Pauline Leonard, co-director of the Let Us Dream conferences in the United States. Thank you so much, Dr. Pauline, for your passion, dedication, leadership, and vision to empower local communities for sustainable impact and improvement. Thank you, Dean Bronstein. And thank all of you who are joining us virtually today for Binghamton University's hosting of its third annual Let Us Dream Conference. I'm delighted to share this message with you on behalf of Father Lee Joe Thomas, founder and director of Let Us Dream. Let Us Dream began with the vision of Father Lee Joe, who saw the need to create a forum for developing strong partnerships between higher education institutions and local community organizations. One primary goal was to provide networking opportunities for service-oriented leaders and other professionals, as well as scholars, researchers, and post-secondary students to connect and share experiences in implementing community improvement initiatives. Out of that vision, the first Let Us Dream conference was launched in 2017 at Louisiana Tech University. Having been a part of Let Us Dream since that first conference, I'm inspired to see the growth of locations hosting this annual community conference. Moreover, we are deeply grateful to Binghamton University President Dr. Harvey Stinger and Dr. Laura Bronstein, Dean of the College of Community and Public Affairs, for supporting this initiative. In fact, Binghamton University was the second higher education institution to host its first Let Us Dream conference in 2019. Now this year, there are six conference locations, two in the United States and four in India. And with the continued efforts of all who embrace building communities of collaboration and networking, Let Us Dream will continue to grow globally. In fact, the annual community conferences have already paved the way for international growth. In 2020, the first Let Us Dream Triennial International Conference was offered. The international event provides an inclusive transnational forum for global networking. It brings people from different countries and cultures together in the belief that collaboration, leadership, and innovative problem solving are essential for improving communities worldwide. So I'm delighted to share with you that next year, Christ University will host the 2023 Triennial International Conference in Bangalore, India from Friday, November 17th through Sunday, November 19th. Also, Father Lee Joe, with the support of Christ University, has arranged to provide complimentary airport pickup and drop off, as well as accommodations and meals you are invited to join us for next year's international conference. As you are aware, the conference today is a free event open to the public and the theme is uniting in divisive times. This is in accordance with the Let Us Dream goal of cultivating inclusive, diverse and equitable communities. Conference planning and implementation involves the tireless work of volunteers representing the fields of education, health, and social services, including those in post-secondary institutions and community service partners. A heartfelt thank you is extended to the conference co-chairs, Michael Kaufman and Jeff Smith, to panel discussion moderators, Pat Follett, Deborah Blakeney, and Carla Mahalik, to Unsung Heroes coordinator, Tracy Lyman, to technology coordinator, Ali Wittenberg, and to Deborah Colette O'Brien, who has been an integral member of the Let Us Dream core team since 2019. Finally, a sincere word of appreciation for the numerous conference presenters and all who have contributed their time, expertise, and support to help make today's Let Us Dream conference 
a reality. I hope you all find today's proceedings enjoyable and beneficial. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Allie Wittenberg. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm happy to be here supporting the conference today. I'm going to talk through a few logistics and reminders to help everybody have a successful conference experience. Um, so first, I just want to highlight our agenda for the day. So we are doing some welcome and introductions. In a moment, we're going to move to our opening keynote, Dr. Lada Granholm. And then we will have panel discussions uh, after a brief break. And the panel discussions uh, are where participants are going to have an option to choose one of three topics. So you will either go to the education, health, or social panel, and we'll give a few more details about what those look like later on. But I just wanted to give you a heads up that we have our opening keynote and then panel discussions, and then an afternoon keynote with Kristen Licardi. Then we're gonna highlight our unsung heroes, and then we will have a closing and evaluation at the end. A few reminders, uh, this session, the conference is being recorded and it will be available and accessible to everybody after today. So if you attend the education panel and you're curious about what happened in the health panel, you will have access to watch that back. And we will make sure that everybody has a follow-up email with the resources and the links in the weeks after the conference. If you need anything today, please reach out in the chat to one of us that's labeled tech support. So if you start to type in um, tech support as a name, you can search for us and write to us privately to help you out. Uh, the live transcript feature is enabled for the session, so you should have access to or be seeing captions. If you need to enable them on your Zoom settings, it would be an icon at the bottom of your Zoom bar where you have the option to chat um, or use expressions. You should see a CC or a closed captions button as well. And we encourage participation when appropriate. So please, we appreciate everybody staying muted to limit the background noise, um, but please use the chat to share comments or thoughts or questions and the reactions feature if you want to um, share an expression about something you've heard that you appreciated or want to applaud. And then lastly, there will be breaks throughout the day. Um, so we'll give some break opportunities, but please take care of yourself during this time. I know it can be a long time to be in listening engaged mode. So please take care of whatever you need to. And we appreciate cameras on, but know that that might not be accessible or feasible for everybody the whole time. So um, please do whatever you need to do to be comfortable for the day. If you get disconnected at any point, please just look to the Zoom information that was sent to you in a confirmation email and in the calendar invite that you hopefully received. So this Zoom meeting will be open all day. And if for some reason you get disconnected or confused or have a technical issue, please go back to the email or the calendar invite and just re-enter the Zoom um, there. And we will, just as a heads up, we will talk through it, but for the panels, we're gonna be virtually sending people down the hall. So you will be leaving this meeting briefly to go to a new Zoom space, but we're gonna talk you through it and make sure that everybody gets where they need to go. But I can't emphasize this enough. If for any reason you have trouble, just go back to your confirmation email or the calendar invite and click that main Zoom link. It'll bring you back to us in this main conference space. Um, we encourage you to share, to explore the program brochure, which is in the chat, to learn more about our speakers and um, the wealth of insights that they're bringing to these conversations today. And participants will have the option to request a certificate of completion um, when filling out the conference evaluation. So at the end of today, which will be one o'clock Eastern Standard Time, we will have a Google form link that you can fill out. And in that evaluation, you'll be able to indicate, yes, I would like a certificate and you can put in your information and we'll email that to you uh, in the next week or so. So those are some logistics and reminders. And I'm now going to pass it back to Michael to take us to the next part of the program. Thank you so much, Ali. Yeah, so yeah, you you have the gist of the program, um, the idea behind it, the sort of intent. I want to just uh, fill you in before we transition to our first keynote on how we envisioned this program as a planning committee. What we were really struggling with is that there were so many specific topics, um, as I mentioned before, environmental issues, political issues, social issues health issues, education issues. And all of you who are joining us today are coming from your individual perspective, your profession, your daily work. How can we create a program that you will walk away with 
that's going to be meaningful, that you can apply to your work. Um, that's not just interesting, but that, that really brings about some change and hopefully also inspires. And the tradition of the conference is to have a research-based keynote to open with, a more applied keynote to close with, and of course the panels in the middle. And our goal was, and I think we achieved it, I hope you guys will agree once you see the program, that they all connect. And the one thing we sort of focused on as a planning group was the human brain, because each of us has a brain. And in times of stress, in times of crisis, in pleasurable times, we act and react as human beings. And whether we're talking pol politicians, educators, clergy, whoever you are, you are a person with a brain and your brain kind of dictates how you uh, interact with the world. And so to open us on that topic, we were looking far and wide and we hit the jackpot. Uh, Dr. Uh, Lada Granholm is an internationally known expert in neuroscience. Uh, you have her biography, you can see, you know, her credentials, but it is just a delight um, to welcome her to open our keynote on this really far wide topic that we uh, try to contain. And I think she's the perfect person to do that. Uh, Dr. Granholm. Thank you so much. Uh, let me see if I can share the screen here. Here we go. I'm joining you today from Denver, Colorado, where we just had a snowstorm. So I'm very thankful for Zoom, <laughs> be able to be on Zoom today. Let's see if we can get started. Here we go. Um, look here, display. And you all see that? We um, see the edit one. I think you want to share the other window. Yeah, I'm having trouble getting my mouse to move over there. Let's see here. Okay. And while we're getting this set up, for those of you that haven't put in the chat where you're zooming in from, please do that because we want to appreciate where everybody is uh, participating from. And get my display to share like it did before. Let me see. Now it's over here. I am sorry that we're ha I'm having this trouble with the beginning. There we go. Now I can go to the settings. Where is the where, and? Uh, Today I will talk about the brain and what happens in the brain, either with aging or stress or trauma. And like you could see, my brain was not functioning there for a while. So it's an interesting study of what happens with stress. I have focused on the brain for about 40 years now because it's really uncharted territory and it's so interesting to see what happens in our brain. And I'll show you some examples, but I will also talk about what happens uh, in the brain with aging and what are things that we can do to actually have a better chance at living a long, healthy life with a healthy brain. So this is my outline. We talk about the aged brain, stress and trauma, influence of lifestyle and what we can do about it. So let's start talking a little bit basics about the brain. And I think uh, most people know where the brain is located. It's my favorite organ in the top of the body. And it has these different, can you see my pointer? It has these different lobes of, of a cortex. In the front is the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe is involved in emotions, association, really thinking about the input that we get from the, from the outside. The parietal cortex here in blue, the parietal cortex is involved in movement output and sensory input. So it's really the connection between what we feel and then what we're going, going to do about it. The occipital lobe is involved in vision processing. And of course, many other things too, but if people have an injury in the occipital lobe, it usually affects how they perceive uh, their surroundings. The brain stem that connects the brain with the spinal cord is very interesting because it has very basic functions. For example, uh, attention, 
breathing, heart rate, all of those things are regulated by our brainstem. And finally, the cerebellum here in the back, in the nape of our neck back here, is involved in postural control and balance. But you could essentially live, you know, in okay life without your cerebellum, but it really coordinates all the movement together. And I think what we'll do is that we will take questions in the chat room. And so you'll have an opportunity to ask questions afterwards. I really think of the brain as an orchestra. You have all these different instruments and it's beautiful when everything works and every instrument is playing uh, as they should be playing. But sometimes uh, there's a discordant uh, movement in the orchestra. One, maybe it's a violin, maybe the drums, the piano, whatever it is, what, there's suddenly something not quite, quite right. And that is when we have different conditions. For example, during stress, many parts of the orchestra are just not working normally. And so what we're trying to do in the, in the neuroscience field is to figure out what happens, why does it happen, and what can we do about it? So let's start looking a little bit at aging. I've been in the aging field also for about 25 years. Since I, I myself started aging, everyone does. Um, I mean, we all know that the alternative would be terrible. But aging is, you know, you can think of aging at different levels. You can think of it at the biological or medical or maybe more philosophical level. So at the biological level, aging means that the cells in our body and in our brain are, are aging at sort of a preset rate. But we're actually able to affect that rate, you know, slow it down so that we are more successful you know, in the continuation or uh, speed it up. For example, if we're smoking, we're actually speeding up the rate of aging of our cells. At the medical level, we know that uh, aging leads to increased risk for both chronic or acute diseases. In fact, if you look at an emergency room, 50% of the visits are from people over 65. So it, it's medically increased risk for, for different conditions or different diseases. And then when you have a viral infection such as COVID, the aged population was more susceptible to that, susceptible to severe COVID than younger people, at least at the very least in the beginning with the first uh, forms of the, of the virus. So the philosophical level is where I really like to sit. And uh, this is because aging is absolutely beautiful. You can agree with me that these faces here it might be aging, but they're beautiful. And they have a collected accumulation of wisdom that is unparalleled. And I think one mistake that we do in our society in the Western world is that we don't listen to wisdom. We don't call our grandmothers enough and ask her for, for advice. We don't talk to our, our parents and our grandparents. And especially true for younger generations, Many of them have actually a lost connection with older generation. And this is something that uh, when I was the director for the Nobel Institute at, at DU, University of Denver, we worked constantly on putting students together with, with older adults because magic actually happens. So it's really an important aspect of aging. It's not just negative. And in fact, when I was at, at the, in South Carolina at the medical university, I started a program called the Senior Mentor Program, and it was pairing up medical students with seniors, you know, people over 65 or 70. And what was interesting is that when the medical students asked their mentor, what is your favorite age? If you could pick any age to be, where would you be? Almost all of them said, now, I like now. So I think that's quite remarkable. Aging, another aspect of aging is longevity. How long does our population live, different populations? And it's kind of always been very interesting to me and a conundrum that in the United States, we spend more money than any other country on research and development for, for drugs, for example. And yet our, our longevity is much lower than, than many other, even Western countries. In fact, a few years ago, we were number 53 in the world in terms of longevity. Uh, where I come from, which is Sweden, 
we're number eight in the world. And I think if we didn't smoke so much, we would actually maybe be number one or two. But it's very interesting and uh, always something I ask myself, why is it that we're lagging behind the other Western countries? So how do we study aging? Well, we like to study those that are successful. I mean, it's always nice to study the people who know what to do. And uh, the one who knew best what to do was Jean Calmon, who was a French woman who lived actually the longest recorded, which was 122 years and 164 days. Isn't just remarkable. You can see her picture at 60 here on, on the right side. And uh, this is her uh, 60th birthday. And I think she looks more like 40. And she just really knew what to do. And um, this is something that we're interested in finding out, of course. How can we successfully? Because there's, there's not just lifespan, but there's also health span. And uh, therefore, scientists have been studying the centenarians. And centenarian means somebody over 100. And I think it's just uh, remarkable. You know, I have actually several friends who are approaching 100, 98 and 96. And uh, I constantly think about what is it that makes them so successful at life. And uh, this is what has been studied in the so-called blue zones. So if you haven't heard about it, it's five different places in, in the world, actually. You can see the map here on, on a world map. Loma Linda in California, Costa Rica, Sardinia, uh, Greece, and Okinawa in Japan. And everybody knows about Okinawa as a longevity nation. And what they do is a combination of lifestyle, but also geography, because where they live is, is uh, you know, a fortunate place with good temperatures and uh, you know, a rich soil where they can grow things and uh, also a philosophical outlook, which is important, a purpose, living with purpose. And maybe this is one reason why many older adults don't do so well in our country. They don't have a purpose. And if, in fact, there was a study called the Nun Study that was studying 3,000 nuns and also priests across the United States. And uh, they were in their 90s. And if you're interested in this, there's a book called Aging with Grace. And in that book, we can actually read about the, the nuns and their approach to life. They had a purpose and very few of them actually had aches and pains. And so when they were interviewed, you know, the, the much younger researcher asked, well, don't you have aches and pains of aging? And they said, well, we don't really have time. You know, we, in the morning I teach kindergarten in the afternoon, I tend the garden. And then I cook my own meals and, and we cook together and we have purpose. Very important. They also don't eat, you know, you have to eat until 80% full. We're not so good at that in our country. Our average intake per, per day is well over 3000 calories. We're supposed to be at half of that. They move naturally. You can see this man here on the right side of the screen who is living with purpose. He's, he's out there with his dog with his sheep and, and really enjoying life. And also diet is very important, of course. And I will say the last point, red wine in moderation. And I'm not supposed to sit here and make a PR for, for alcohol, but the fact is that uh, one glass of red wine a day or so is uh, used in many of these blue zones very successfully, actually. So if you're interested in how to do it, there actually is and I'm not, uh, you know, I don't have any uh, economic interest in this book. It's just a book that I have bought and I started making recipes out of it because it really shows what type of food you should be eating to live long and, and uh, successfully and, and in harmony. So, but the most important trait for centenarians was actually this one, optimism. So I like this cartoon uh, because it really shows that the situation that many of us are in today, we might be in water up to here. So how can we possibly in that situation think about being an optimist? Well, being optimistic is actually sort of a personality trait, but it's so important for successful, uh, both middle-aged and aging, 
essentially every, every age. In fact, we know that people who are optimists have a less bad outcome of dis many diseases, for example. And uh, I think actually at UCSD, they have now training sessions for how to become optimistic. And it's, uh, it's, it's become more interesting and in focus. And I think that this conference today really focuses on how to be optimistic in the face of adversity. How do we go about doing that? It's not so easy, but it can be done, I think. So the unfortunate other side of aging is not just being optimistic and e eating well and movement, but we also know that chronic diseases are increasing with age, in particularly in the brain and in the heart. So here are three different, this is sort of aging statistics here of three different conditions, ALS, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that all, all three of these will actually go up with age up until here, 60, 69, or 70. And this is actually, the reason why it drops off here is actually because there is mortality, that more observed actually in people over, over 70 with ALS. And so these diseases all go up with aging and we're going to look at some of these today. We're gonna look at both dementias and also movement disorders. So let's start with dementias. Uh, it's very common. And, and what's also common is that people kind of confuse the term dementia with, for example, Alzheimer's disease. So to clarify the, the terminology a little bit, dementia, if you look it up in, in Webster's, for example, is a general term for symptoms. It's not a particular disease in itself. It's loss of memory, language, problem solving, or thinking capability what we call executive function, and that are so severe and also progressive that they interfere with daily life. So there used to be these four different forms of Alzheimer's disease, the most common form of dementia. So it's really a sort of a subclass of the dementias. Then there's vascular, Lewy body, frontotemporal, and now lately also uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE. And this is the condition that we see, for example, in football players. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. But CT is something that is actually not even recognized by all, by all pathologists or neurologists. It's something that has just been recently, the last 10 years, been discovered. It's been shown in over 350 NFL players, but it's not necessarily something that 100% of neurologists believe in. It could be because of the massive amount of money involved in the field. And so that also becomes a part, part of the discussion here. So the most common form is Alzheimer's disease all over the world, actually, and they will double in many, many countries uh, the next uh, 15 or 20 years. And so it's very important to study, but we don't know really what the reason is for Alzheimer's disease. We know what the condition looks like in the brain. We know what the symptoms look like, but we don't really know the reason for why some people get Alzheimer's disease. Here are some of the different clinical signs and symptoms, uh, forgetfulness, denial, navig difficulty navigating familiar space. But all of these together, the important thing is that you might see very subtle change in, for example, a spouse or, or a mother or father and so on. But the important thing is that there is a change that you observe that happens maybe not daily, but maybe monthly or yearly, something that slowly happens with, with, with age. And what happens in the brain is uh, four different things. And here is also like an orchestra. These are four different things that happen in parallel. And uh, what people have tried to do is focus on medication for one, maybe two of these. But I think that successfully stopping what's happening will be very difficult since all of these different things are happening simultaneously. The best thing, honestly, to stop or, or slow progression is, is lifestyle. And we'll talk about that. So uh, protein aggregation happens in the brain. And what this means is that proteins that normally have a good function are now malfunctioning. Uh, we have the two most common ones are amyloid and tau. Amyloid will aggregate in what we call plaques. You can see them up here to the right. 
this blue clumps in the brain is like a sticky glue. And these will fill up more and more and more of the space in the brain until finally there's no, no room for anything else. And inside the nerve cells is this uh, yellow structure here, and that's called a tangle. And tangle is formed by tau, this protein. And tau also fills up inside every nerve cell. So it essentially strangles the nerve cell from the inside. And these two things together will lead to that we have a nerve cell loss that goes on and on. So that finally, if you look at the down the picture here in the middle, you can see on the left here that the whole brain will actually start shrinking and will weigh less and less. So a person who has this much shrinkage here is actually someone that has may not even remember their own name or the name of their spouse or children and so on. This is very advanced. And what one process or two processes that help advance the stage to, to this level are inflammation and oxidative stress. And so inflammation is very important lately when we talk about COVID, because what COVID actually does is get inside the brain and infect the brain. And what we have noticed is that Alzheimer pathology is, is actually accelerating with COVID. So inflammation is something that we're working on actively trying to get good medications that will actually help inside the brain, not just the body with inflammation. And oxidative stress happens, you know, you can see the star-like shapes here in brain tissue that is oxidative stress that kind of spreads and pops up and that's also hindering normal, normal function in the brain. So what we have done is try to find early biomarkers and what a biomarker is a measurable substance whose presence is indicative of phenomena such as disease or aging or, or other conditions. You can either look at a biomarker as imaging, different imaging methods, or biomarkers in blood or in, in cerebrospinal fluid, where you would have to do a lumbar puncture, which is shown here on this cartoon. Or you could also study tissue after death in the brain by, by using a brain donation as to see what fully went on inside the brain. And so we think that the least invasive is actually take a blood sample like shown here in this cartoon and look inside the blood sample to see what happens. To start with looking at uh, imaging methods, we have two different ones that could actually diagnose different forms of dementia. Uh, this one, PET or positron emission tomography. And what, what people do there is inject the substance inside the blood that is radioactive. And then it will light up different parts of the brain to show if you have specific binding for these proteins. So this here is showing a tau PET, and this down here is showing an amyloid PET. So the more red it is, the more binding you have. So you can see this in this Alzheimer patient, there's a lot of red and yellow, sort of uh, bright colors. That means that this brain has lots of tau, this brain has lots of amyloid. This is very expensive and it's not available everywhere, but it's something that is coming as a new diagnostic tool. So sometimes the university hospital will have it. We have it here at the University of Colorado, for example, but it's very expensive. It might cost $5,000 to have that done. So we prefer to look at something else. You know, Is there something else that we can look to see what's going on in the brain? And we started working on uh, these little guys here, these little bubbles that actually looks like a football helmet here. We call these exosomes. And exosomes are released from every cell in the body. And then they have these little markers on their surface, which is nice because the little markers would show us where, which cell did each bubble come from. So we can simply take a blood sample, purify just these bubbles that came from the brain, open them up and look inside. And we, it's like a message in a bottle. And then we can see what's going on inside the brain. This is brand new technology and it's showing us something uh, magnificent. So what we did is that we took uh, about 100 blood samples from people who, are, who have uh, no condition, uh, the white dots, and those with Down syndrome, because we know people with Down syndrome, actually many, most of them will get Alzheimer when they age. And, and that's a whole other topic for another talk. But what we found essentially is that when we looked inside these little bubbles, 
we had both amyloid, or the, the labels are, are kind of light here. We have amyloid inside the bubbles very early in life, actually between five years old and, and 30 years old. And we also have tau very, very early. And so this tells us that the brain nerve cells are making these toxic proteins much, much earlier, much earlier actually than, than we thought, much earlier, 20 years before you have any symptoms. So this kind of technology can actually help us see what's going on inside the brain long before we have any symptoms, but then we could put in uh, medications. So that's a little bit about dementia. I will talk a little bit about movement disorders also. I know I'm kind of delayed in my, so I don't know what, what kind of schedule I'll have, but you're, I will. You're all set, Lada, plenty of time. Oh, I got plenty of time. That's good. Good, good. So uh, movement disorder also happens, you know, where, where you can see actually dementia is about happening in people over 80, you have 40% that have some form, form of dementia. And the same thing with movement disorders. And uh, I will first say also that uh, some movement disturbances happen in, in also with normal aging. So at the bottom here, you can see different classification of different forms of movement disturbance. So with normal aging, uh, we walk slower, we have balance issues. My mother who was 92, it was always practicing her balance, uh, you know, every day, whatever she did, she was trying to stand on one leg, but her balance was, was impaired. MS, of course, uh, you know, you have movement dis disorder, you know, a specific form. Same with ALS. The most common one is Parkinson's disease. And so what we have in Parkinson's disease are a set of symptoms that help physicians determine if someone has Parkinson's disease. It starts with tremor, and you can see a little cartoon here. Tremor simply is, is shaking. And usually people with who have beginning Parkinson's will have what we call resting tremor, meaning when their hand is just sitting in the air or lying down on, on a chair or something, it will start shaking. The gait is slower. So you can see here in the middle, uh, this is from a gait lab that we work with. Normal gait, you, you can see, you know, it's nice and uh, sort of spread apart the steps. And with Parkinson's disease, you get a very particular type of gait. It's what we call shuffling. It's difficult to lift your legs and you're shuffling forward with very small steps. And there's also balance impairment and very rigid muscles. You can see it in the facial expression sometimes on people with Parkinson's disease. So it's very, it's, it's a difficult condition also. And there also are no good medications, actually. As with dementias, we don't have yet good medication. We have somewhat better for Parkinson's disease, where we have something called L-DOPA, which kind of prevents the breakdown of some uh, specific nerve cells in the brain, but, but uh, not very good medication here either, unfortunately. But we're going to talk about what we can do, actually, in terms of lifestyle. So we know, for example, both in dementia and in Parkinson's disease, that we're actually able to, if we exercise regularly, if we eat the right kind of foods, we're able to slow progression of both of these conditions. So in the brain, what we see with Parkinson's disease, this is the brain stem, uh, this part here that's lit up with red. And in the brain stem, in a person with Parkinson's disease, you see a, actually loss of these, a band of cells here that are in the normal uh, brain here. They're called substantia nigra, dark substance, because they are, you don't have to stain these. They are naturally black, dark like this. And these are disappearing in Parkinson's disease. And these are the cells that help with motor coordination. That's why we get the tremor and, and difficulty walking. And what we see inside, if we look really closely at every cell, is these kind of uh, moon, looks like a full moon here. They're called Lewy body, and they're also accumulation of a particular protein called alpha synuclein. And what happens now, we think that the very latest thing in this field is that we think that people with Parkinson's disease will, if they live long enough, they eventually develop dementia and of a Lewy body dementia type, meaning they get these Lewy bodies all over uh, the brain now. And that's what affects their, their uh, speech. It, it affects their thinking, memory, 
association and so on. So it's very unfortunate, but it's some kind of aggregating protein that spreads kind of like a seed in the brain. And that's why people are now talking about both, both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease as a prion disease, because prion is a seed that spreads. And we think the same thing actually about Parkinson's disease. So let's talk for a minute about uh, other conditions, you know, that are external conditions that affect the brain. Stress, for example, we know that stress is an, a natural reaction. It's the fight or flight reaction in the, of the brain. But if we are stressed and if it's chronic stress over a long period of time, I'm thinking about caring for someone with dementia, for example. It will affect your digestion, your sleep, your immune system. You get more susceptible to, to uh, uh, different infections. It affects your energy. Uh, it actually makes you susceptible to mental illness, dementia. But we also know that moderate stress can improve brain performance, actually. So it's very interesting. We need stress, but not too much stress. We don't need to be uh, you know, in isolation lonely, bored, but we need some kind of little bit of stress to, to keep moving. And especially caregiver stress is especially dangerous, actually, because what we know about caregivers, long-term caregivers, is that they have, for example, 15 times higher risk for dementia. That's a huge increase in risk. So what can we do about that? Well, we can uh, try to think about different lifestyles. We can take a break. We can, uh, you know, focus on nature. We can focus on our dog. If we have a dog, we can go for a walk. And we can actually have to try to deal with very actively with stress because it's very damaging in the long term for the body, for the heart, uh, but for the brain as well. And so uh, we know that the brain controls the body. And so what the brain does is send out signals, you know, to the adrenal gland and then to the, the heart, to the eyes, uh, you know, to the liver, to, to the lungs, everywhere, essentially, the brain is sending signals that says, hey, I'm on high alert. My heart is gonna pump, I'm gonna breathe more quickly. And this can actually become a chronic condition if we just don't know what to do with, uh, for example, our loved one that has dementia and so on. Uh, what it leads to is actually like, the blood brain barrier, which protects the brain from infection, will start becoming leaky. So now we're susceptible to everything that's in the blood, including infections, virus, bacteria, and so on. And so it also makes us susceptible to Alzheimer's pathology. So it is no joke. We really need to think about stress and how we deal with it. Uh, PTSD, of course, post-traumatic stress disorder is a particular form of stress and is becoming more and more common. And we see it particularly in, in uh, persons who are active service members who have been uh, seeing atrocious things uh, abroad and are bringing this back with them and are not able to actually uh, get rid of that. Uh, but there are now new research that focuses on PTSD to see how we can better uh, deal with it. It's caused by emotional trauma to the brain when, when a person sees or experiences things that uh, they should not experience that are horrific uh, war situations. It could be horrific abuse as, as a child. This actually triggers three parts of the brain. You can see a very nice schematic here on the right side. The insular cortex, which is the green one in the middle. Uh, the amygdala over here, deep inside the temporal lobes, and the frontal cortex. These three work in concert together. And what they have shown by looking at MRI, what's called functional MRI, while someone is having these kind of attacks of PTSD, they see that they act in concert and that they have overactivated. All three areas are overactivated, but they're also smaller in size meaning that they have been so activated for such a long time that they're actually shrinking. And so what can we do about this? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a horrific condition. And, and one thing that I have noticed lately is that people are using canine approach to this. So there are many, many centers across at least the United States and also I think in Europe that are 
that are educating dogs to work with someone with PTSD because a dog has a special way of dealing with emotional stress that humans are not as good at. So I think it's, it's one uh, fantastic way of working with PTSD. But there are also some things, uh, you know, there's uh, something here at the, at the bottom that's called stellate ganglion block or SGB, where they're injecting a local anesthetic in the stellate ganglion on the, on the neck here. And this is actually a center that sends out the, the fight or flight impulses to the body. And they've noticed if they block that, the person would stay calm in, in situations of perceived stress. So this is not, it, it could be triggered by something very common, you know, the alarm or, or something could trigger PTSD attacks. So it's, it's nothing that most people would, would experience, but it's very focused and, and can activate it. And so it's a particular type of stress that is very damaging and can affect people's life forever, essentially. So the last part I wanted to talk to you about is brain trauma. It has been in the news a lot lately. And last night I had the opportunity to be, all day actually yesterday, I, I was spent time with a former NFL player. His name is Dave Stalls. He has three Super Bowl rings. So he played for the Buccaneers, the Cowboys, and the Raiders. And he was talking to a group of psychology students, and, and we spent a lot of time together talking about his, his experience with the NFL and how it has affected his life, because it has changed his life forever. So brain trauma is something that we really didn't know anything about when I was in graduate school. But it turns out that many athletes, for example, or service members, who are experiencing repeated trauma to the brain. It could be many, several mild concussions or a few more severe concussions, like playing hockey or lacrosse or, or uh, football. And uh, it's, it's a, a new type of dementia that I mentioned called chronic traumatic encephalopathy that was denied and actually still is denied by the NFL. And eventually the players uh, sued, you know, they started in, in 2013, 4,500 NFL players sued the NFL because they were sort of darkening all of the data that suggested that they were, they were uh, susceptible, more susceptible to neurodegeneration. And in young ages, we, we see three players up here who, who all suffered from CTE and uh, died very young. This is Mike Webster, who played for the Steelers. And, uh, you know, my, my friend Dave Stalls played against Mike Webster, you know, many times uh, together. And he was an amazing, he was the star player of the Steelers for a long time, 17 years in the NFL. And uh, this man down here at the center, Bennett O'Malley, had the pleasure to, to uh, look at his brain, Mike Webster's brain, and found some very disturbing findings. So what his brain looked like was like this. All of these black things are dead nerve cells with tangles, tangles inside. He definitely had CTE. And here's a very severe CTE case compared to a normal brain slice. And so what we also know that is that repeated head injuries, injuries such as in lacrosse or, or hockey or, or football, gives you not only increased risk for CTE, but ALS, Parkinson, Alzheimer, and so on. And there are these subtle changes that happen over time that actually lead to a major, a perfect storm as you get older. So we formed a team, it's a huge team at the University of Denver and University of Colorado both. We have the athletic performance team working with us. We work with the, the lacrosse players, the hockey players, and the DU hockey team won the nationals last year, actually this year. And so we've been studying and working with the hockey team to see what their biomarkers for trauma are early on. Here are some demographics. We have over 400 people now, actually. This is my son, Lars, who played soccer for DU and also had his share of, of concussions playing soccer. But you can see that lacrosse are actually leading. They are leading the league for the number of concussions, 46% of lacrosse players came in 
uh, to college with already multiple concussions. And this is why you can see what happens in, in lacrosse, and what happens in hockey. So what we're doing is that we're studying these uh, individuals, uh, we're doing memory tests, and this all collegiate athletes have to undergo this. We do memory tests when they come in and also after a concussion. And then we look at their blood for biomarkers. And what we found is that typically this is a baseline and this is their concussion and one week, one month and six months after. Typically they go back in after one week. And what we find then is their reaction time is, or is deficient also after one month. And then their impulse control is actually deficient, keeps going down over the months. And so this is something that uh, people haven't really looked at before. And then we started looking at what, what are the little exosomes looking like. And in the bubbles, the exosomes, we see that two markers for trauma are elevated. In these young people, 18 to 25, who have a history of concussion. And so now we're wondering what happens in the long run. So it's, it's interesting to look at this. And, and at the same time, we started looking at their athletes. We actually had lots of athletes come in with COVID and many of them who had had multiple concussions had more severe COVID. So it became natural for us to start looking at COVID and the brain and also what happens you know, um, in the brain in, in so-called long haulers, those who are more severe COVID that last a very long time. We know that COVID can affect the brain. It can come into the brain. And so it will, it will cause structural and functional changes to the brain months after the patients get better from COVID. So our questions are right now, can the virus remain in the brain long after infection? And what would that look like? And Lotto, so, this yes. Is, this is Michael. I just want to gently step into your excellent presentation. We're about at the 10 minute mark. Yep. And um, there are a few questions if you would like to entertain them at the end. Yes, I, I have one or two slides left, I think. And so I'm, I'm getting there. I will, I will uh, wrap up, definitely. Yeah, so if you compare COVID-19 and concussion, as you can see, identical, identical symptomology. And so this is where we are right now with this research to find out why is that? What happens in the brain with concussion? What happens with the brain in COVID? And so you can actually see the virus in nerve cells in the brain, which is interesting. And these are just our questions now. What can we do about this? Can we prevent the virus from getting in the brain? And can we also lower the impact of, of long-term concussion? But so to end with this uh, in, in this presentation is what can we do about it? We can actually do a lot. These are two slides. And I think, you know, we will, because they are recorded, you will be able to go back and look at these in more detail. But there are many risk factors that are many of them are environmental. So both for dementia and I think also for COVID, also for Parkinson, that many have the same mechanisms. We can actually be physically active. We can follow a healthy diet, challenge our brain, look for uh, uh, both diabetes and cardiovascular disease and actually uh, remove that risk by taking medication or taking measures. All of these things will actually improve brain health. And uh, there are multiple studies. I'm not going to go into detail with these studies, but they have uh, shown that just moderate exercise, walk with your dog and so on, can reduce the risk for Alzheimer with 50%, actually. Many studies show that. Also in those that have a high risk for Alzheimer, exercise can do this. And, and it's very important to talk about cognitive reserve. And so there's a study called the finger study. If you're interested, you can look at it. And it's sort of an all round lifestyle where you look at uh, multiple domains of intervention, diet, exercise, cognitive training, mindfulness, but also management of, of risk factors are very important. And they find that they can actually slow progression of Alzheimer and prevent Alzheimer with just these lifestyle factors. And so, you know, you can look at the slide afterwards, but it's actually, looks at protective factors and risk factors. And now there's a worldwide figure study that will actually go into more detail about this. But I did wanna show real quick that 
uh, canines are very important and can actually provide, there are now canines for dementia families, families that have someone in dem with dementia. And we have done a stress study together with the University of Denver, Kevin Morris, looked, that looked at the effect of dogs, the presence of a dog on stress and lowered heart rate in their handlers. So it actually has, dogs have a massive effect on the body as well. So to finalize this, everything is a concert here too. All of these lifestyle, injury, genetics are playing together, but we can you know, be mindful of these things and actually work towards a healthier brain and a healthier aging. And so with that, I just wanna say thank you. And I'm sorry that I got delayed in my start because of, of the technical issues. I don't think I don't think you need to worry one iota bit. Um, the, you know, this this is it always works out just beautifully, and it has in this case. Lada, there are a couple of questions. Um, the one uh, you mentioned exercise and uh, in the longevity study, and the question was very vigorous exercise versus more moderate exercise, and uh, that's the question. That's a great great question, and actually, it turns out that uh, people who, for, who decide to run marathons, for example, when they're 65 or 75 or 80, that does not prolong their life. And so moderate exercise, and I think this is because of mindfulness, because I think when I'm out walking with my dog, uh, you know, I, I am with the dog and I'm with nature, but you know, you see lots of people out walking and they're stressed and they're rushing and uh, they're looking on their phone and they're telling the dog to hurry up. Uh, that's not, that's stress. Mm -hmm. And so it has to do with exercise done with mindfulness. And so I think that's very important. Absolutely. Danielle Clemens asks, and I, I mean, it's a, it, you mentioned optimism training. And uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. They have, it's UCSD. I think they have this training. And what the training consists in actually changing your mindset. And so what, what you have to do, my mother was excellent at this. So my, my, and my brother, I can give an example. My brother had diabetes. He lost his leg and then he got a prosthetic limb instead. And he said, you know, these, these prosthetics are so good nowadays and I'm going to drive my car. Just wait a couple of weeks and you'll see. And it's, it's just a mindfulness training to figure out to think about what to be thankful for every day. I actually do this. In the end of the day and the beginning of the day, I think about three things that I'm thankful for. And, and it helps change my mindset, actually. I've had students that are very aggressive and angry. And I tell them, when you wake up in the morning, make yourself, uh, make your mind set on being kind, on, on thinking about positive. And sometimes you have to just write it down you are alive, uh, you're well, you, even if you hate your job, switch jobs, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a mindset, but you can train, you can train on it. Absolutely. You, you just answered Dr. Pauline Leonard's question, who, who wanted to know exactly about meditation, mindfulness, and all that. No, that that's a very, it's actually a very profound um, observation you share. Um, not to open up a whole nother presentation, but many of the participants work with children and uh, young people. Um, stress and the growing brain, uh, probably a whole other side of this, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, and there you could either talk about uh, emotional stress or, or actual stress. And, and it, we know, for example, that uh, children who grow up in, in abusive homes and where they have to be the parent and take care of that, that affects them long-term. And we've actually done studies on mice and rats, believe it or not, where we, we handled them. And so we had a rat study where we handled them fond, you know, fondly, petted them fondly, took care of them, and then other, other rats that were grown up in isolation. And that's a whole other aspect of this. Uh, we know that the brain changes in a growing brain. Uh, you know, there, there's a protein called BDNF. And when we exercise, it goes up. It's called the wellness protein. And in children who, who are abused or grow up in isolation, BDNF levels are very low. And in people who commit uh, crimes, 
BDNF is very low and it affects thinking. So, you know, if you have, have an abusive environment as a child, your BDNF levels are low. You can explain it on, at the protein level, actually. Wow. Well, I, again, thank you on behalf of all of us who are uh, listening. Um, thank you so much for really volunteering, jumping in on this conference, um, preparing our opening keynote. And uh, really, really appreciate it. And I see in the comments in the chat, uh, lots of thank yous. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I enjoyed it very much. And I will enjoy the rest of the conference too, of course. Absolutely. And with that said, Lana, I turn it over to Ali to um, take us a little further. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Lada. Uh, we are actually going to, excuse me, uh, we are going to take a brief break and we will do this for about 10 minutes. So I'll put that in the chat um, and I'll put a break slide up. Our panels are going to start at 1030 promptly. So if you come back at 1025, then you'll get the instructions of what to do there. So I'm going to put some music on and we'll take a brief break and we'll ask that you come back in 10 minutes, which will be 1025 Eastern Standard Time. So we'll see you all soon.